We can get rolling if everyone's ready. Just want to welcome everyone to the webinar here today from TTRA and our partner, Smart Insights. Stephanie is going to be leading us, and we have Rob and Marlise on the call as well. Um, I know she'll probably cover a little more detail, but if you have any questions, drop them in the chat, and I will make sure to get them to everybody after the presentations. Enjoy. No. Oh. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm just going to uh, share my screen so that we can get started. So um, thank you for joining us for uh, the second edition of 15 Favorite Findings. Uh, we really love to hear how our uh, research is being applied um, in the voice of our clients. And it's especially fun to learn how the research is applied to developing and improving destination marketing. So instead of talking about how to do research or focusing on the results of just one study, we're mixing it up with this Pecha Kucha style format. And even better, I'm going to turn it over to a few of our favorite clients to talk about a few of their favorite findings. Before we dive into this topic, um, I'm going to very, very briefly introduce Smart Insights to any of you who aren't familiar with our company. Uh, SMARI uh, was founded in 1983 by Dr. David Seaforth. Um, some of you might have caught David in the piano lounge um, at MOF a few weeks ago. Um, we've been known by the acronym SMARI um, since we started working with destination clients in 1990. SMARI Insights was created in 2015 to focus entirely on the needs of destination organizations. Many of you think of us for our specialization in advertising effectiveness and ROI research, but we do quite a lot of creative testing, brand and image work, and resident sentiment research as well. And our team works all together in Indianapolis. Um, here's the Smarty Insights team. Our analysts are shown here in blue, and our in-house support team of data collection managers, our programmer and editor are shown in yellow. And what's really remarkable about our team is that um, everyone shown here has been with the company for 15 or more years, um, working on many hundreds of research projects, with the exception of Jordan and myself, who have more recently joined after being on the client side of SMARI. I'm pretty sure I started being a SMARI client in around 1995. <laughs> um, so it's been a long um, and happy relationship with the company. So, okay, back to the reason you tuned in today. Uh, we're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so hearing from our panelists. Each person will share a selection of their favorite research findings from a variety of research projects. They will tell us about the finding, share why it is important to them, and talk about how the finding has been applied to their destinations marketing strategies. We'll take your questions at the end, so feel free to post in the chat as we go along. We're joined today by two destination pros. Unfortunately, um, Ashley is unable to be with us today, but she'll share her favorite findings at a future webinar. Our first presenter will be Marlise Taylor, the Director of Research for Visit North Carolina. Marlise is going to share six of her favorite findings and then turn it over to Rob O'Keefe, the President and CEO of the Monterey County CVB. I'd like to thank them both for sharing their insights with all of us today, and we'll turn it over to Marlise. Thanks, Stephanie. Yes, yeah, so I couldn't pick just five. And so I emailed Stephanie last week and I said, can I do six, please? And she said, yes. So um, thank you, Stephanie. Um, before I get started, though, let me, I just wanted to kind of give you a lay of the land or, or kind of where we're coming from at Visit North Carolina. So <clears throat> we've been working with Smart Insights for a couple of years, having recently uh, finished an effectiveness and impact study on our 2021 campaign, which was kind of, you know, it's coming out of the pandemic. And our intent in 2022 is to do the same, but with a three-prong approach with that campaign instead of uh, what we had done before as a two-prong. Um, however, due to some unforeseen um, delays in our advertising campaign, we, we shifted last year and we did our, the first wave of the study um, on the competitive positioning of North Carolina so that we could take a deeper dive into traveler mindsets and attitudes. At the same time, we knew that it was important for us to start exploring new markets. So for years, all of our research from many different vendors has said, or you know, has shown us that um, North Carolina visitors are loyal 
So once we can get them hooked, they become repeat loyal um, time and time again visitors. So without dropping our current markets, we wanted to understand some new markets as well. So simultaneously with doing this study, we also worked with Smarty Insights on a market potential index to understand the best fit for emerging markets for us as well. So I say that because using the data that I'm going to show you today, along with that uh, market potential data, it has really set us up for um, when we finally, or it set us up for when we finally were able to get into market last year. Um, like I said, it was a little delayed, but it's also going to continue to serve us as we launch a new campaign, which is coming out in just a few weeks. So there's some things I won't be able to share yet um, that we've used this data for, but, but know that we have a new market or a new campaign coming out um, in just a few weeks. One more thing before I, uh, I move into the slides, we're really conscience in North Carolina about the protection of our brand and what brings people to the state and what it means to be sustainable in a very broad sense and proactive in attracting these new visitors. So we're of the mindset that there's plenty of North Carolina to go around. Um, there's plenty of North Carolina to promote and using dispersal to spread that visitation around um, both uh, the calendar and the state itself is going to be crucial to us in the long term. So that's kind of my intro here, but let me show you my favorite six slides. <laughs> so I cheated just a little bit and I added a little to this one, but um, so this, this slide uh, is from the first wave of our study last year in 2022. And like I said before, it's digging into that traveler mindset for our core markets, as well as uh, we tested a few new markets just to, just to see what um, the mindset was. But this study confirmed to us that we're advertising in the right markets. Uh, but we also learned that appeal for North Carolina is strong in our emerging markets as well, even though we don't quite have that visitation yet. But taking that a step further, using uh, some planning attributes and some experience attitudes, uh, Smarty did a factor analysis for us, and they created five market segments that are based on trip planning preferences and attitudes rather than just demographics and geography, even though we were able to then look at these segments based on demographics and geography. <clears throat> but using these five segments, we were then able to better understand how visitors to North Carolina travel and what appeals to them at, in, in terms of a leisure destination, you know, and which segments align most closely with what we have to offer travelers as a leisure destination. So here you can see in just a small snippet, and it, again, it was hard to pick, <laughs> it was hard to pick slides. But as a result of this analysis, we are leaning more heavily into this discoverer and segment and enricher segment. Um, while we learned that the the relaxers, there you can see at the bottom, the relaxers uh, are very strong in terms of visitation to the state historically. We do know that discoverers and richers will give us both those new geographic opportunities, but also be, their markets or their, their categories or segments that are, a, are attracted by what we have to offer in North Carolina. So really quickly, discoverers prefer to visit new places and they like to be the first of their uh, set of friends or family to visit a destination. They also, as the name implies, like to discover their way through a destination and prefer places off the beaten path. So we thought that really fits well with what North Carolina has to offer. And then the richer segment enjoy learning about new cultures, unique history, which North Carolina has so much history, and then immersing themselves into the culture of a destination. So the next slide is also from the, the first wave, but this slide or this chart shows us where in our current and emerging geographic markers that we'll be able to find those enrichers and discoverers. So our core markets, as you can see at the top of the graph, um, have the highest proportion of, of both segments, which are in the green and orange. But new markets that we're looking at, including Illinois, Indiana, and some new Southern markets, also index high for the, that discoverer segment. So we also learned, not in this particular slide, but in our competitive set, we have the second highest appeal percent for both the discoverers and the enrichers. This has really helped us understand against our competitors where we're performing very strongly. So both uh, the discoverers and the enrichers uh, showed high levels of both familiarity with the state 
and, and visitation, though I will say that there are some competitive states with higher levels, and that's really where we're going to be, we're coming to get y'all. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're focusing on where can we go steal some visitors from, but, but that really helps us to understand both where we can find these, these types of visitors and, and where else they're traveling now, so we, we, you know, we know where to go. Okay, so the slide three is actually from the second wave of our study, and this wave focused on the awareness of our shortened campaign. So without going into a lot of details, we, we were delayed, whereas we're usually kind of in market more of an April through the end of the year. Uh, this year, it was a late August, so we really missed the high travel season. So the campaign was definitely shortened. But the campaign itself in that short amount of time generated 43% awareness in our target markets. Um, and as you can see, discoverers, so those are in the lighter blue color, the discoverers were more aware of the advertising than any of the other segments. And they had, they had a 52% awareness of the advertising. Uh, not surprisingly, a digital and display advertising had the strongest awareness of those media types, uh, but discoverers also showed strong awareness for those um, print ads in National Geographic. So that was really interesting for us as a team, both me as a researcher and our whole marketing and advertising team to understand um, in terms of these new segments for us, you know, where, where are we catching them? Where, um, where's the awareness the highest and, and what can we do moving forward to continue to appeal to those? And just as an aside, not in this particular slide, we found that awareness uh, of the campaign by families with children was particularly high, which was really interesting for us. Families with children in the household represented about a third of the travelers in the study in our markets. And their awareness was 55% compared to 36% of those with no children in the household. So the awareness of course was higher across the board by type of media, especially digital and display. But if you'll recall a few slides ago, um, family-centric was one of the segments that we didn't necessarily choose. So uh, it, it was interesting to see that that awareness by families was particularly high, and we're, we're working on what to do with that. So the next slide, uh, slide four here, this is from wave three of our study, and this was just performed last month, and it focused on those trips to North Carolina and the impacts of the campaign itself. So this slide has a lot, but it's, it's one of my favorite slides, uh, and it's why I chose it. Um, you know, the researcher to me likes as much data as can get on one slide, but overall our campaign had a travel increment of five and a half percent and it influenced 750,000 trips. But knowing again that our study period wasn't even during the uh, highest season for travel in North Carolina, this slide shows us that ad aware lift by market in terms of likelihood to visit. So we're still hoping to see more travel in the spring and summer based on that campaign last year. So where did, you know, where did this campaign perform the best? This is really helpful for us as a state marketing organization in showing, you know, our funding providers, our legislators, our policymakers, just what our advertising brings to the state. Not, you know, you hear all the time, well, they would come anyway. Well, yeah, you know, a certain percent of them certainly would come anyway, and they, they have been coming. And again, they're loyal visitors. But, but what is that lift? And to see our lift by market and then by segment is extremely helpful um, for us. So you can see here in terms of just likelihood to visit North Carolina, our advertising campaign impacted Florida, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and DC the most, all with 20 point lifts in likelihood to visit. So then uh, slide five is also from the, um, the last wave of our study. And I know you all talk, we talk about ROI all the time, but, but it really is important for us. It really is important for us to have this um, to justify our existence, our budgets, uh, you know, who we are and what we do. But this campaign, even though it was a shorter campaign, it influenced a total of a billion dollars in visitor spending just from September to January, returning $217 in visitor spending per dollar of media investment. And what we use the most, quite honestly, is this 20 to 1 return in tax dollars to every dollar spent in paid media advertising. That is so important for us to tell legislators that for every dollar that you give us to advertise North Carolina, we're going to bring back $20 in tax revenues for you. So that is so important. 
But I will tell you, this is something new that we've done, and I'm so happy with this. But in calculating these numbers, we decided with SMARI on a very conservative approach. And I like that because you all know that a lot of times people don't believe our numbers. And we, and we have a hard time explaining the true impact of, of tourism. So what we did with this equation was we removed those travelers who are motivated by visiting friends and relatives. We know, you know, that in North, North Carolina has grown tremendously in population over the last several decades. And so there are a lot of VFR travelers in the state. There's so many VFR travelers. We didn't want to take credit for those because that's not what enticed people to visit. We really wanted to take a more conservative approach. We also removed travelers from the equation who have second homes in the state. Um, so I believe in doing so that we're presenting the most conservative and realistic numbers to our industry and, and decision makers. Um, we also only considered ad aware trip spending, which really goes a long way in terms of our transparency to those decision makers. So this, this slide is probably the top slide um, that we'll use going forward. And finally, I, like I said, I cheated a little bit. I have six slides, but this, this is my last slide, but I just wanted to show uh, what, you know, the actual trips that, that did happen as a result of this campaign. So we talked about likelihood to visit in, you know, a couple slides ago, but um, looking at the travel that did occur during the time period, the markets of Ohio, Virginia, South Carolina, and DC, had the highest level of incremental travel. So going back to the segments that we created back in wave one, we learned that advertising was a positive influence on the, on the quality and the types of trips that are taken to the state. Um, in fact, that discoverer segment, um, it influenced them by 8.9%. And these travelers also reported very high satisfaction with their visitors to the state. And we learned, and this is my final statement, but we learned that this advertising was really impactful in recruiting first time visitors. And you'll remember from my beginning, we really want to attract those first time visitors because we know that they will become loyal and repeat visitors to North Carolina. So those are my top six slides um, and happy to answer questions later on, but I'm gonna turn it over to Rob now to talk about his favorite slides. All right, thank you, Marlies. Um, not to be undone, I have six slides too. How about that? Um, a little background on me. I, um, uh, I've been working with Smari in one way, shape or form for over 20 years, uh, going back to uh, my days in Missouri where I was working on state tourism um, on the ad agency side. What, what most people know is, um, MMGY now, I was there before the Y and worked there for a number of years. Um, so I've got a lot of agency background, uh, but I've always embraced the research component and everything I've done and been involved in um, is always research-based. I've enjoyed working with Samari. I gotta tell you the best time to, um, to discuss and sort of dig into the findings of a focus group, for example, is in the bar after the focus group with David Seaforth, if you can, uh, if you if you get if you get his attention there, because that's where the magic happens with Denise and David there. Uh, but I won't go any further into that, and I don't don't worry, David. I don't have any slides on that. Um, so I want to uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit and talk um, about application in a variety of different ways because we have worked with Smari in a variety of different ways, both going back to when I was in Missouri and what we're currently doing now uh, in Monterey County. We're we are at the brink of uh, rebranding the destination. And um, like I said, everything we do is research focused. So we are continuing to work with Smari in new and interesting ways. But I, I thought we would just um, highlight and bop around a little bit how we've worked with them here in Monterey County to give you all an, an idea of the range um, context um, of, of what they can do and how we work with them. So this first slide, uh, I won't dig too much into each particular slide. I want to focus on context. And the one, this is really important. This is one of my favorite things. We decided a few years ago that we're no longer the a, a typical advertising DMO, right? Where it's, you do advertising first, and then you figure out what the PR angle is, if any, and then you throw some social at it. Instead, we switch to a content marketing organization and we, I don't know if we were the first, but maybe one of the first to 
asks Mari, we, we don't want your, your, your standard ad effectiveness study. We want a content or a marketing impact study. And one of the things that was really important for us to capture is what's the effect of PR? And for me, a content marketing organization, you start with the content. You almost start with social and PR before you even think about uh, paid media. And we wanted to examine what the impact of PR is to a traditional media-driven campaign. And this slide, you can see some pretty impressive results if you account for both in your marketing impact analysis. You can see here um, over the, the last few years and where we currently stand, the impact with PR, particularly in the drive market, if you look at the right-hand corner of the slide, and our drive markets, and we're mostly a drive market destination, but we aspire to be more of a national brand, and we're working on getting there over time. But you can see where, where there is a pretty significant lift when you factor in PR. And as I think most people understand, people don't admit to being impacted by ads. They don't, they wanna, they wanna act like they're not, but we all know that they are. But then you layer in the PR, and then in addition to that, um, the social content and how that's influencing uh, folks, you can see a, a, a giant lift, 18 points in our dry market and 15 points in our fly market. So that's, I, I guess I would say, if you're not doing this, you should be, in my opinion, and Smari knows how to get it done um, because that PR effort really does enhance what's going on in the paid world. Okay. Um, like I said, I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Coming out of COVID, we wanted to be aggressive when it came to um, attracting uh, meetings and conferences. And we started with a hypothesis, right? I, I typically do this and uh, Denise is watching and I believe she is, she's probably chuckling because it's always one of Rob's hypothesis, we gotta figure out if it's true or not. And I'm certainly open for them not to be true and certainly they've been disproven my hypothesis over time. Uh, but this one was proven out. And here we looked at the sales cycle. If you're trying to sell to a meeting plan, to bring in a large group or conference or even the small groups, you look at the, the life cycle or the narrative driven by the salesperson and how long does it take that person to get from the first handshake on the trade show floor to closing the business? And we all know that that's a very relationship driven part of our business. But how and where does advertising and content impact that? How can we shorten that? How can we look at if the person, that first handshake on the trade show floor, uh, that person knows something about Monterey County? And what we found, and you can see here, is if we had um, the uh, advertising focus and the contact by the salesperson, there's a significantly beneficial impact. Um, you can see with uh, no interaction, with ads only and no contact, direct contact only and no ads and both. And you can see that lift there. So our goal is to use our marketing and our content and our messaging to shorten the time it takes to get from handshake to close business. And Smari was very helpful in us proving out that hypothesis. Um, we are big believers in sustainability and, and responsible travel. Um, we know that not everybody travels based on sustainability. In fact, few, not, not, not a lot of people do that, but a lot of people do have some level of consideration uh, towards uh, going to a destination and, and the level of a sustainability and, and how to be responsible. So we we dug into that a little bit to understand what a green traveler is. And a green traveler is anyone who uh, rated uh, five out of five on the five point scale on when selecting a place to visit for leisure. And that, that's a very important thing for us when we look back a few years and we started our sustainability program, we call it um, Sustainable Moments. Sustainable Moments is based on our tagline, which is grab life by the moments and our philosophy is that we're, if we're going to encourage people to grab life by the moments, we want to make sure that they ensure every moment they're enjoying today is left every bit as pristine for the next person who's traveling and, very importantly, for the residents who live in our destination. So we really dug into this and we found that there are certain folks who will travel specifically for 
uh, or to be in a sustainable place. But there are, but there are more people who will travel, um, who it's an important factor when they're traveling. So there are people who are diehard green travelers and there are people who want to feel good about going someplace that has some sense of itself in terms of sustainability and responsible travel. And so a lot of our focus, in fact, we barely do anything that doesn't have some mention, leave no trace, um, be respectful, that type of thing in, in our marketing. And then you can look here um, how that rates among green travelers. So these are for people who find sustainability issues and responsible travel important and how uh, the, the ratings and the difference between the green traveler and other um, stand out. You can see green traveler, we're doing, we're doing very well with our messaging to sort of, let's call them the diehard green traveler, but we're also having good impact with other. And those are people who might not base as much importance on sustainability and green travel, but they certainly factor it in. They're certainly aware of it. And we just did some uh, focus groups uh, for this new brand that we're, we're rebranding right now. It won't be Grab Life by the Moments come this fall. And Smari is, uh, is playing a big role in that for us and the rebrand to inform the creative. Um, and what we found over time when we went to the East Coast, we went to the Midwest, sustainability and responsible travel is important. Uh, it, it varies by market, uh, but it's always sort of, something that people are considering more and more, which we appreciate because we are more and more a diehard um, destination when it comes to responsible travel. I, I like to tell people, if you're not, I'd like to run an ad campaign that said, if you're not prepared to be respectful of our destination, go somewhere else. Now, I probably wouldn't have my job very long, so we're not gonna go that far. It's in the back of my mind. Um, one of our particular challenges is, and um, because we're on a Zoom and I can't see any of you, but um, I would say by show of hands, how many people know that Monterey County, our destination, encompasses Pebble Beach, encompasses Carmel by the Sea, encompasses Big Sur? Um, probably if we did have a show of hands, um, many of you wouldn't have your hands up because one of our biggest challenges, and we're addressing it with this rebrand, is people don't understand proximity and the various components that we have as a destination. So I've got another hypothesis and it's being borne out by these focus groups we're doing and this analysis that Smari is doing with us. I look at our brand Monterey County as kind of like Nike. So Nike is the brand and Nike has a variety of product lines. They have the Michael Jordan basketball shoes. They've got the tennis shoe. They got the golf shoe. They got a variety of different shoes. Those are product lines. The direction we're going on informed by the research we've done with Smari is basically that Monterey is this brand halo over these product lines of these destinations that are distinctive in and of themselves. And we've got to do a better job of connecting the product lines, Big Sur, Pebble Beach, Carmel by the Sea, with the overarching brand. And that's one of our big, biggest challenges right now. And that's uh, our focus. And I appreciate the work that we've done with Denise and her team to help us guide the path. And I think that's it, okay. my part. And I'm happy to answer questions as well. All right, thank you so much, Marlise and Rob. I thought that was so much fun to hear you talk about the research and what you're doing with it. And I know it's just the tip of the iceberg for both of you. There's many, 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 many more uh, pages and findings. And so um, let's see if we have any questions. Zoom does not want me to look at questions and share my screen at the same time. So <laughs> um, let's see. I am looking for you, Stephanie. I don't see any in my chat window right now, but I don't know if there is any, anybody wants to jump in and type one in. I'm happy to relay it. Give everybody just a couple of minutes to see if there's anything. Marlise, one of the things that I was thinking um, when you were sharing the slides was how like enrichers and discoverers were, you know, the areas that we recommended focusing on, but they're not really the majority of people in the population. So, you know, I thought it was really fascinating that your strategy was to pursue these high value segments, even though they were a smaller portion of the population, but they responded 
you know, disproportionate to their numbers. Yeah, so they're not the top visitors that we have right now, but the appeal that they that North Carolina has for them in terms of what they can do and, and who they can travel with and what they can experience really fits well. And especially, like I said, with our, and I, I hesitate to use the word sustainability because it's, it's, I think it's broader than what we typically think about with sustainability, but I really think it, it fits in with our, let's just call it a dispersal uh, plan that we have. We really want to promote those areas of both the areas of the state that that aren't seeing as much traffic now. And also, you know, seasonally, there are, there are so many things to do, especially post pandemic, where I think people um, got used to um, looking at other times of the year to travel. And so we have a lot of places in North Carolina that we can promote. So if we can find those segments of travelers who have um, an affinity towards our state and that we could encourage them to visit either other places or or at different times, then I think it's a win-win for all of us. And like you said, they are a higher value traveler. I think you guys are such a great um, case study in the application of segmentation that it's not only about how big is the population, it's the population times the potential and looking at who can be motivated and who can, you know, where you can differentiate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I would echo uh, what Marlisa is saying. Um, we have the same thing as part of our overall responsible travel. We've got to be responsible in how we promote travel and dis, uh, dispersion is really important. Um, people come here for the aquarium or um, you know, Cannery Row and those types of things, but we want them to know, get out to other parts of the county so that they can uh, experience that and it spreads it out, it spreads out the benefits. And it's kind of like when back in my Missouri days, we had sort of the, the, the triangle where you had Kansas City, St. Louis and Branson, and then all parts in between. And when people started to discover things like Carthage, Missouri, where you get precious moments, the Hallmark store little icons, or Hannibal, Missouri, where there's a big motorcycle rally, but of course it's where um, Mark Twain came from, and all these other unique places, you really in, enrich the traveler, uh, and you also do a service to the destination, whether it's a county or a state, and that's really important. Yeah, I think you were on the leading edge of that kind of thinking. And I wondered, Rob, I have a two part question for you. The first part is, you know, I wonder if you'd be willing to share a hypothesis that seemed intuitive to you as a marketer that wasn't borne out in research. And then the next part of the question is like, you know, what's next on your mind for something you're wanting to explore with research? All right. So you're asking me to tell you when I was wrong. Yes. <laughs> I told you when I was right, so I have to share when I was wrong. Um, okay, I think that we jumped the gun a little bit on sustainable travel, and we thought that a lot more people, and this is going back five, six years, so I think this eventually is being born, so, born out. So I'm telling you something I was wrong, but I'm starting to be right. <laughs> which is um, we thought that people would be a lot more selective about where they travel based on the uh, owning that notion of being sustainable and being green. And the reality is, and I'm saying this, I'm the uh, current chair of the Sustainability and Stewardship Committee for the California Travel Association. And I've said this to them too. Don't overestimate how many people will travel for sustainability. People are not, there is a percentage, it's a small percentage of people who will only go to a place if they feel that they practice responsible and sustainable uh, um, behavior. It's a small fraction. And you see headlines a lot of times like the growth in sustainable travel is, is increasing significantly. It is, but it's going from maybe if the total population people will only go somewhere where responsible travel is, or, or sustainable practices are in effect. Maybe it's going from 2.5% to 3.5%, which statistically feels like a pretty big deal. So I think, and Smari helped us understand that phenomenon and that it's, it's a slow, it's a slow moving thing. It's happening. But if you base all of your game plan strictly on that, you, you run into a problem. Now we have other places here uh, in California and there's other places that go like uh, Lake Tahoe is, is having a hell of a time right now. Um, and much of their budget is spent on promoting sustainability because 
they've got some challenges and there are other places in the world, Machu Picchu, uh, Everest, other places where the word over tourism gets used. And that becomes a different mission. Uh, fortunately, we're not in that spot yet. But yeah, there was a time where we we sort of we felt really good. We're going to go out there. We're you know we're we're pushing the environment and and all of that and all of that's important. But you can't go back to your stakeholders and tell them this is the future. We got to do everything about this right now. You got to gradually move into it. So that's that's uh, I think that's one example. What was the other question? Well, we were interested in like what's next on your mind. Well, I, I think, and I'm, I'm gonna also pick up from a few points that Marlise mentioned, you gotta, obviously we have to show a demonstration of benefit to our stakeholders and our elected officials and so that they understand um, what, what we do creates value. And we need to, for us, um, we need to evolve what used to be called the ad effectiveness study to what we call it now twice a year, uh, with Smari, we call it our marketing impact study. It measures content across the board. And you saw some of the difference between PR, with PR, without PR. We're going to roll out soon an ROI study. We're going to call it an ROI study. Um, ROI is going to be return on influence because we're real careful to say that we're influencing travel. What are we influencing directly and what are we indirectly influencing? We want to know both and need to express it in terms that are understandable to a um, Supervi a county supervisor or a newly elected council member. And, and that's something that I think SMARI is particularly adept at doing. But sometimes we tell ourselves, you know, we speak to ourselves in the industry. So when we get a report back, we're like, well, this makes perfect sense. I'm going to talk to the ad agency and we're going to do this, that, and the other thing. And we've got to make it very clear to our stakeholders, which sometimes we don't always do. So that's, that's on the horizon. Well, and I'm glad you ra raised the issue of stakeholders. I'm um, looking forward to being with Marlise and the North Carolina team at their annual conference in a couple of weeks. And I know Marlise is really, you know, thinking about how this research that informs their decisions and, um, you know, their strategies moving forward can be useful to the tourism industry. And I wonder, Marlise, if you could kind of touch on that. Yeah, sure. So yeah, so parts of the study were specific to our ad campaign, but but in terms of the um, looking at, at the awareness of North Carolina as a leisure destination, looking at the appeal of North Carolina, and you know North Carolina is is a long state, and, and there are many different geographies, there are many different types of visits that you can make, and you know understanding which markets um, North Carolina appeals to, not just um, in terms of their geography, but in terms of what we offer. And so I really am excited about sharing some of this research with our partners, our stakeholders. We have 100 counties in North Carolina. And so, you know, there's a lot of this research, even though it is specific to visit North Carolina, I think there's a lot of this research that could be teased out for our partners, particularly those that don't have the funding or the um, of uh, the way to perform this type of research. So I'm really excited about that because, you know, helping them understand who we're marketing um, and why we're marketing to those segments, um, you know, the discoverers, the enrichers, or even looking at the, the other three segments, you know, it may be that those segments as defined fit better with certain partners and then they could then take these learnings to apply at, at their level. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, we don't have any questions, so I think I'm going to wrap up by just, you know, maybe asking you a question that's not quite so research focused and just taking it. Oh. Oh, do we have another? I do see one um, okay. from Wendy. So, oh, sorry. You, sorry, Wendy. Um, um, do any of you think that COVID is still skewing any of your research results? Uh, Marlies? I don't think so. And not, not our results. Um, I think well, let me let me take a step back. I don't. I think the impact of COVID is more um, a continuation of what I think we were starting to see anyway. Is that people wanting to spend time outdoors, enjoying that natural scenic beauty, getting away from it, 
embracing the authenticity of the place they're visiting. So I think we were starting to see that anyway. And I think the pandemic really pushed people hard and fast into that. You know, we saw um, areas in our mountains in particular that had their best years ever in 2020 because people wanted to get away. They wanted to travel, but they wanted to be away from people. So, but I think we were starting to see a little bit of that anyway. So I think it exasperated it and maybe sped it up, but I think we were starting to see that, um, that type of uh, segment, if you will, being attracted to North Carolina as a leisure destination. So, I, you know, I guess, so the answer would be sort of, but not, but not really. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably echo that a little bit. I think we, uh, you know, we are uh, same kind of destination at the county level where it's outdoor scenic beauty and outdoor adventure are the main things people come here for. And that really, that helped us during COVID in a big, in a big way. I, some of the restrictions, there's still pent up demand out there based on COVID. So you could say in a way that um, that that impact is still real. I mean, like, for example, with China, um, there are a lot of us waiting for China to open up and it's slowly starting to open. Um, and that's going to be something that we're going to see, I think, unfold. It's my hypothesis. We'll see if I'm right. Uh, over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, there's a lot of a lot of people applying for travel visas in China, wanting to 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 travel, but it's a process and it's going to take time. And that obviously is related to COVID. But um, as it relates to what we're doing, um, we are building on. I, I think maybe what Marlies was saying too is building upon that that silver lining out of COVID that emphasized what people come to our county or her state for, and it gives us, I think, a, a better or more firm platform build upon. So we're trying to take the, the, the positive out of what was obviously a, a global crisis and build upon that. I think one other thing, and not to, uh, not to be ironic because we're on a Zoom, but I think that the writing of the ship when it comes to conducting meetings is still happening. Um, I think Zooms like this are perfectly fine. I know a lot of meeting planners though, they want to get, there's a Zoom backlash. They want to get back to in-person so that that's still happening, and, and I think we'll, we'll we'll watch and see how it develops. Yeah, and if I might add, um, whereas I said I don't think COVID is skewing our results, that's not to say that we're fully recovered yet. You know, there are parts of our state that are not fully recovered yet, and is you know more of the urban centers uh, where they rely on the business travelers and the meetings and conventions. So I'm I'm not saying that everything is perfect and back to where it should be. I'm just saying I don't think the pandemic itself is skewing the research. I, I do think we have a lot of work to do um, to assist those different parts of the state in, in getting those visitors back or, or, bring, or using our segments to bring new visitors to them as, as leisure visitors rather than uh, strictly be, uh, business and meetings. So I'm not saying we're back, but I don't think, I don't think the research is skewed. I will say that, you know, we're still um, very mindful of the impacts of COVID in, especially in international markets and, you know, the way that it affects screening for recency of travel and the comp set and how, you know, the effects of COVID and, you know, and now moving into economic and, you know, safety issues. And, you know, I think we're still seeing those effects as they apply to um, consideration sets and screening criteria in international markets. But, um, okay, I don't see any, any after Wendy. So we're, in our last few minutes, I just wanted to, you know, ask each of you as kind of thought leaders in our industry, you know, what, you know, we've just talked about COVID and we're kind of moving um, beyond the direct impacts of the pandemic. And so, you know, what are you most, what's most on your mind for the year ahead? Well, for us, and I'm, it's not just me, but our entire team, like I said, is really focused on um, marketing North Carolina as a year round destination and, and um, really helping those partners who have not seen those great increases. And so I think um, this year is the first year and we're still working on it, but we are, um, we're shooting and um, taking photography for all seasons in North Carolina. So it's not just the, the summer and fall, but we are out there um, shooting. We um, recently finished some uh, winter shots. So I think that's going to be really important for us. And then to be able to measure that, you know, on a 
on a different basis than we ever have been before. We've always, you know, kind of had that spring and summer campaign uh, measure in the fall and then and then the next season. So um, I'm excited about more of a year round look. And I think our whole team is. And like I said, we have a, camp, a new campaign coming out in just a few weeks. So I can't say a whole lot, but we're really excited about that as a team and excited to study that with Smarty Insights again next year and, and to find out how um, how impactful it was or it, it will be. Great. Rob, what do yeah. you think about? Well, I, I think as it relates to Smari and everything relates to Smari as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> because it's research and it fuels what we do. Literally, we are starting with this rebrand where we we um, focused uh, uh, in uh, November, December on getting uh, more data um, and fueling that. We're in the process now of completing a creative brief that's going to launch a new campaign in the fall. So. Working with the with the group up front, Smari and our agency, and then redoing this ROI study that we're going to create that that's probably never been done before the way at least I imagine it, and we're still in the early pages of talking about it. But really, the big thing for me is rolling out a new brand at a higher level um, with broader reach, and having a better way to effectively measure that and and demonstrate that value. Um, uh, that's that's big for us on the horizon, and um, and I'm really glad to, to to have a great team to work with that fuels the information needed to do that and be successful. Well, we really appreciate both of you and the expertise you've shared today, and the enthusiasm you've demonstrated for uh, the research that we've gotten to do together. And um, for everyone on the call, we uh, if we saw you at Marketing Outlook Forum, gosh, you know what a testimony to the power of in-person meetings, and you know how fun it was to see everybody and the energy that was there. And so we hope to see everybody in St. Louis um, in just a couple of months. And so thank you very much for, uh, to TTRA for convening all of us and supporting this webinar, and to uh, Rob and Marlise again, thank you very much. Happy to do it. Thanks. See you all soon. Okay. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.